um, webinar series and you may already have been with us um, for previous sessions on the series. It's a series that started in uh, October 2020 and it's part of the multidisciplinary and transnational project on thematic ethics, the circulation of bodies in migratory spaces. And it's a project that is funded by the Education University of Hong Kong through Bedisha Banerjee uh, in partnership with La Maison Française uh, d'Oxford uh, in Oxford through Thomas Lacroix, who is here as well, and the Research Center Emma at the University Paul Valéry Montpellier 3 through uh, myself. So there is a website for you uh, to know more about the events, uh, flesh and blood, you know, events, physical events on campus that should be organized in the next few months. And you can write to us as well to be put on the mailing list. So this talk, as you have seen, will be recorded. So if you don't want to appear on the, on the screen, just switch your cameras off and make sure you have your um, muted mics um, as well. And I'm sure you'll have um, questions also and comments at the end of uh, uh, the talk. So the sessions generally last an hour, but often get you know extended uh, a, a little bit. So if you could put your questions on the, um, in the chat, it would help you know monitoring time and speech so that uh, benefit is shared by um, by all. So today we are delighted uh, to welcome Valérie Loichot. So as most of you will know, she's a professor at Emory University and she travels between, across and with um, literatures in French and in English. I will not say French literatures or English literatures with a strong focus on the Francophone and the Anglophone Caribbean and the, the US uh, South. So of course she has many, she's well known for uh, many articles and uh, her edited volume as well on Edouard Glissant. Um, Valérie is particularly renowned as well for her books, um, orphan narratives on post-plantation literatures and uh, the Tropics Bite Back, Culinary Coup in Caribbean Literature, you know, it's such a wonderful title. And more recently, Water Graves, and Water Graves brings together poetry, mixed media art, underwater sculptures I mean, produced in the Caribbean and in the US um, Gulf Coast you know, to explore um, artistic and aesthetic ways of memorializing the drowned in the aftermath of the Middle Passage and of um, Katrina, but more importantly, um, of situating, in fact, the present day migrations in the aftermath of slavery, forced transportation and massacres, and addressing what Valérie calls the unritual. So she will you know, tell us um, more about that. Um, just the, the personal you know, touch in the, in the introduction, um, Valérie's style of uh, thinking, writing, and interpreting the world is quite unique. Uh, and I think I can single it out among you know, many. Um, I always look forward to what she's going to write next. Um, and so for the moment, we're very much looking forward to listening to her. So thank you, Valérie, for having accepted our invitation. We are delighted and honored. So floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Judith, for this more than generous and, and moving introduction. It's It's been really nice knowing you and exchanging ideas for the past, uh, I think about 15 years now. So, uh, so it's nice to reconvene again uh, here today. So as uh, Professor Mizrahi Barak uh, said, this intervention is a return to my book, Water Graves, which was published just about one year ago, with today a special focus on sculpture, which I find particularly fitting for the Thematic Ethics Research Group convened by the Center for Popular Culture in the Humanities at the University of Hong Kong, Emma at the Université Paul Valéry in Montpellier, and the Maison Française of Oxford University. I'm grateful and honored to speak to such a transnational and distinguished group today 
I was happy to recognize some names um, in, uh, in the, uh, amongst the spectators today. And I thank you for the invitation. And I would like to thank particularly Judith, uh, Bidisha, and Thomas. Toma. Ai Weiwei's arrangement of human bones remains the emblematic photograph of this thinking group, as well as a sentence in this group's mission statement, and I quote your mission statement, we may wonder what happens to these bodies, what happens to these bones, are they repatriated back to the homeland? If not, are they in a cruel twist of faith, simply buried in mass graves on the foreign shores they tragically failed to reach while alive. The poster and statement convinced me to choose sculpture today amongst the multiple media I investigate in water graves. Due to its three-dimensionality, tangibility, and hardness, it's the best medium to provide an ersatz for missing bones in the aftermath of what I call unritual. Unritual is the privation of ritual. As I define it in the book, unritual is a state more absolute even than desecration or defilement, since the latter imply the existence of a previous sacred uh, state or object, a temple, a grave, a ceremonial. Unritual, the steering concept of water graves, is the obstruction of the sacred in the first place. Anthropological paleontologists mark the first burial as the threshold of humanity. In Things Hidden Since the Foundation of the World, philosopher René Girard proposes that the tomb, I quote, is the starting point of the constitutive displacement of culture. Quite a number of fine minds think that it is literally true on the level of human history as a whole. Funerary rituals, he concludes, could well amount to the first actions of strictly culture of a strictly cultural type. Following Girard's logic, the stripping of rituals is a fundamental attempt to uncouple humans from their humanity. Through the prefix un, referring to absence or undoing, I consciously linked unritual paradigmatically with the word undead. The unritual and the undead dwell in a state of limbo between life and death, where those gone without appropriate rituals persist in living amongst and haunting the living. Victims of the unritual are akin to zombie figures roaming in the texts and works featured in water graves. I use the Haitian Creole spelling of zombie instead of the Americanized, Hollywoodized zombie since the Haitian spelling conserves the liminal figure state of dehumanization, of deontologization produced by enslavement. The Haitian and Caribbean, more generally, zombie has a body, a shell, a carcass stripped from her or his soul and being. And then there is water. I return to the phonetic ethics main statement. Are these bones simply buried in mass graves on the foreign shores they tragically failed to reach while alive? But what happens to the bones, we should add, when they are underwater? Bones are nowhere to be found, but also potentially everywhere, thus creating an enormous loss and haunting, an enormous absence and a throbbing presence, which Martinique and poet and philosopher Edouard Glissant featured in his inaugural essay of Poétique de la Relation, La Barre Couverte, or The Open Boat. In that text, Glissant reads the corroded weights attached to the enslaved humans as an underwater text punctuating the bottom of the sea constituting, I quote him, an enormous beginning, an enorme commencement, which can never be processed out of the abysmal belly of the sea. And I will read the quote in French uh, for those of you who need the translation. The English translation is on your slide. Ainsi, toute navigation sur la splendeur verte d'océan 
suggère-t-elle avec une évidence d'algues ces bas-fonds, ces profonds, ponctués de boulets qui rouillent à peine. Note what is missing from the text, human bones. Human bones do not even resurface as symptoms in the text. The bones are missing, human bodies are missing, only ballast and sunken instruments of torture, the corroded bowls and chains, manifest their haunting in the present of those navigating the Atlantic and of those reading the text. There are no bones. I want the bones. Uh, these were the two epigraphs on the first slide of this PowerPoint presentation. And these are um, urges from uh, poet M. Nourbeze Philip, who cries out in the Notenda following her poem Zong, um, these two, uh, these two urgent uh, needs. There are no bones and I want the bones. The poet lawyer from Trinidad and Tobago ponders, does it mean, and I'm quoting uh, Philip, does it mean that unlike being interred, once you're underwater, there's no retrieval? The gravestone or tombstone marks the spot of interment, whether of ashes or of the body. What marks? the subaquatic death, unquote. This talk from a book focuses on the three-dimensional, the hard, the tangible. In the ultimate loss of bones, what the artist can best bring to the unritual is the sculptural. However, it is not as simple as this for that. Water and ritual renders impossible any functioning exchange of currency, whether emotional or memorial. Water and ritual, I will show, creates a paradox in the practice of sculpture. The works of sculptures like Jason de Kerr's Taylor become unpredictably nebulous. The intangible words of poets like Nubese Philip become hard as rock, as if to show the impossibility of unearthing or unacquiring, I'm coming back to this term later, the memory of those departed and simultaneously the impossibility of not doing it. I focus today on this life creating paradox of liquescent sculptures and bone water. So I come to my first uh, section, liquescent sculptures. We have to begin with what water grave sculptures is not before understanding what it is. With a detour through Hegel who defines sculpture as the ideal art form or as he calls it, temple of the mind. I quote um, Hegel on art, religion and philosophy here. The spirit which sculpture represents is that which is solid in itself, not broken up in the play of trivialities and passions, end quote. The response to Hegel, the challenges to rigidity, didactic function, authoritarianism and spectator passivity which scholar James Young has highlighted on his work on counter monuments in the aftermath of the Shoah are also particularly helpful in understanding the post-slavery art of the Caribbean, which similarly represents a painful and incomplete memory of a partially disappeared people. Like post-Shoah counter monuments, memory, memory art produced in the aftermath of the Ma'afa or Middle Passage needs, and I quote James Young, brazen, painfully self-conscious memorial spaces conceived to challenge the very premises of their being, unquote. Jason de Kerr's Taylor's art enables alliances between the human drowned, underwater roots and growth and the sacred. His sculptures installed underwater across the oceans recreate structures friendly to the regeneration of species, threatened by human alteration of the environment, by providing long lasting supports for coral regrowth, fish, sponges, crustacean, and other microscopic organisms. His official website includes the encyclopedic environment rubric in which are listed the inhabitants of the shallows, lobsters, hermit crabs, shrimp, starfish, coral, sponges, etc., etc., and the alliance they form 
with the anthropomorphic and non-anthropomorphic sculptures. Photographs of these symbiotic relations, creating a new habitat for the living from statues evoking underwater death, permeate his website. To take but one example, and this is your uh, illustration, the head of a drowned uh, woman detailed from silent evolution, which might have once appeared cadaveric with her empty eye sockets, is now bursting with life of multicolored sea moss and a white sea egg, which adorns her chest like a decoration or an ambivalently erotic prickly caress. Taylor's sculptures are both meant to evolve and to eventually disappear. They are works of creative vulnerability, of life enduring precisely thanks to its transient and relinquishing nature. They reach power through frailty. They demand intervention and cooperation, whether through human or choral signatures. Taylor's website provides multiple examples of this beauty reaching full bloom precisely when it changes through ecological alliances. The statues in Taylor's underwater museum or Musa in uh, Isla Mujeres in Cancun, Mexico are meant to be overtaken by coral within only a few years. And you can see some of this evolution on the um, juxtaposition of these two slides. Taylor's sunken community concretizes Glissant's theoretical claim that our landscape, I quote Glissant, is its own monument. Not only do landscapes constitute monuments, but more crucially, monuments revert into landscape in an unbroken continuum of living memorialization. Thus, Taylor's and nature's relational ensembles can also become unremarkably gray formless and ultimately indiscernible as works of art. Thus, Taylor relinquishes not only his statues, but also his very aesthetic gesture, which can become secondary or even instrumental to his ecological goal. As scholar James Buxton concludes, Taylor's underwater society will be eventually, I quote, totally assimilated by marine life, transformed to another state, a challenging metaphor for the future of our own species." Unquote. This is a lesson for humanity that after asserting our monumental strength, we have to relinquish the primacy of our species, the recognition of humans, of our own damage onto land and ocean must come with the realization of the planetary impact of our own industrial and colonizing hubris. It is through trembling, the ephemeral vulnerability that we can survive in relation to use Grisson's concept. Coral life is particularly apt to perform a durable ephemerality through its relational properties. Its worldwide presence in shallow tropical waters provides an apt example of submarine relations between vulnerable zones in the, the Atlantic, Pacific, and Indian oceans. Dying coral reefs are screaming evidence for the urgency of preserving life on the planet as we know it. Indeed, about 60% of the world's reefs are at risk due to human-related activities. It would be ludicrous to see initiatives such as Taylor's as a practical solution to reconstruct quickly disappearing reefs on the planet. However, we can hope that his art may increase the visibility of their endangerment. In the book, I mean, there's much more to say about coral and in the book, I, um, I delve at length to uh, the use of a coral aesthetic by, um, by Mauritian poet uh, Khal Turabuli uh, in what he calls coral imaginary and I, invite you to read the details in the pre-circulated chapter where uh, Turabuli talks about the properties of, of coral as being hybrid and liminal, symbiotic, and also, also beautiful. So um, just, uh, just going fast here. 
Um, one of the les lessons of Taylor's practice is that sculpture paradoxically needs to be fluid in order to, be, to provide effective forms of remembrance and reverence. The next installment of this talk, focusing on Trinidad and Tobago and Canada, poet M. Nourbeze Philip, seems to contradict this conclusion. More than with incongruity, though, we are faced with chiasm. Just as rocks must become liquid, impalpable words must become concrete. It's precisely this encounter of the fluid and the solid, of the permanent and the vulnerable, and of the tomb and the wake that provides the most valuable aesthetic tribute in the face of the unritual. And I arrive at my second section, bone water. Words can act as a pale, yet vital substitute for the hardness of lost bones. Philip claims that the concrete solidity of her 2008 poem, Zong, memorializes those departed without national or personal monuments. Philip explains, I quote, I use the text of the legal report almost as a painter uses paint or the sculpture uses stone. The raw material of Philip's poem comes from the world of law. It is the court transcript that ultimately condemned the slave traders who threw overboard approximately 140 African captives in order to collect insurance money, thus turning humans into jetsam. While moved by law, the trial does not do justice since it incriminates not, it, since it incriminates the traitors not for their inhuman crime of killing human beings, but for having fooled the insurers. The verdict sanctions not the crime against humanity, but the financial fraud and swindling. And I'm quoting from the uh, Gregson versus Gilbert uh, case. It has been decided whether wisely or unwisely is not now the question that a portion of our fellow creatures may become the subject of property. So this is wisely or unwisely. It's not our job to decide this now. This therefore was a throwing overboard of goods, concludes um, the verdict. It's a question for Philip to create some love, justice, reparation, or ritual in a situation of absolute unritual in which the law itself offers no recognition of the African victim's humanity. The drowned humans are locked up in a status of movable goods that forecloses legally and sacredly any mourning within the context of the law. The law itself, Philip argues, and I quote, in its potent ability to degree that what is not, as in human ceasing to be and becoming an object, a thing or chattel, the law approaches the realm of magic and religion. The conversion of human into chattel becomes an act of faulty transubstantiation, the equal of the metamorphosis of the Eucharist bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ." Unquote. While the Eucharist converts quotidian staples such as bread into sacred substances, the transubstantiation operated by law has the opposite effect. It turns sacred human lives into commodities. If the law governing the enslavement of humans gains a magic and sacred aura to believe Philip, it's a malevolent one. As herself both a lawyer and a poet, Philip must rectify the law reverse the sense of transubstantiation by giving humanity and sacred back to the victims of the legalized and ritual through her practice of poetic creation. Poetry, poiesis as act of making, relays a faulty, even criminal law. While it is possible, albeit extremely difficult to recover bones from a mass grave in Bosnia, Philip explains, Retrieving bones from ocean floors and abysses is unachievable. Language itself fails in describing what such a retrieval would look like. Philip dismisses exhuming the verb to exhume as an appropriate word. 
Indeed, exhuming comes from exhumus, out of the soil. From this linguistic void, she coins the term exaqua. And you have uh, the quote right here with, uh, along with the first page of the Zong poem. What is the word for bringing body, black bodies, for, sorry, what is the word for bringing back bodies? And she, we could also read black bodies from water, from a liquid grave. I found words like resurrect and subaquatic, but not ex aqua. Does this mean that unlike being interred, once you're underwater, there is no retrieval that you can never be exhumed from water? And I'll let you um, read the end. If we conceive of the poem as retrieving bones and reconstructing evidence, it will need to adapt its forensics to the particular conditions of an oceanic search. The incommensurable fathoms and width of the seas, the constant mobility of waves and currents, the movable sediments, and the disintegrating properties of salt water. Thus, the poem itself will be adaptable, mobile, floating, yet resting on the random flotsam and jetsam left behind by shipwrecks and the murder of humans thrown overboard. And on this point and the point of the wake, I encourage um, all of you to read Christina Sharp's um, In the Wake on Blackness and Being, which is really a, an in, fantastic and indispensable um, book. The poem brings back meaning into the, cha the chaos that it exact was by associating a hard poetics of bones with a liquid aesthetics of water. Not surprisingly then, Philip's book Zong is composed of disparate yet complementary items, the spine and cover, the front matter, some dedication, several epigraphs, the acknowledgement, six sections of the poem per se, a glossary, a manifest, a an notenda, and the 1783 Gregson versus Gilbert court transcript. They are all presented on the same plane, hierarchically unmarked, not unlike Ai Weiwei's remains, the poems complementing a legal document, which complements a linguistic glossary, which complements an essay in critical theory, Notanda, and vice versa. On all the pages of the poems constituting the section called uh, us, us, or O, OS, names of drowned Africans are listed below the bottom margin. You can see some of this happening also on the first page of the Zong. So there is the poem, then there is a dividing or uniting, unifying line, I don't know, I think both at once. And then you have names um, of uh, drowned Africans that are listed at the bottom of the page. So Philip connects the underwater realm to the above water. Graphically, a divining or joining line marks the horizon between an above and a below between the present of the poets and readers and the past of the departed. The line connects, and I quote Philip in her notenda, those who have died but continue to work on behalf of the living, unquote. The line is also the sacred Kalunga line of the Dikanga or Congo cosmogram, which represents a permeable border between the realms of the living and the dead. The relation between the aforementioned sections is not only successive, but also intrinsic. Indeed, the poem per se is built entirely of words, syllables, or letters found in the two-page court transcript, at times becoming meaningful, at times nonsensical. Glissant in his works increasingly calls the poem or poetry, poetry in French to refer simultaneously to the aesthetic value of language, but also to the act of poiesis, of making. Poetry in French phonetically evokes poetry or pottery and pétrir to knead, as if one needs uh, bread. Poetry is thus an aesthetic gesture steeped in staple materiality. La glissance poetry as pottery, Philip sculpts matter, the dough of the court case into sounds, words, and phrases, forming new assemblages. She explains her method, the, her method or her experience. Um, the text, 
The reported case is a matrix, a mother document. I devise a dictionary with a list of each of the mother words, followed by the words containing that particular word. For instance, apprehension yields hen, Zion, pare, and pair to list a few possibilities. I think of these poems as the flesh. The earlier 26 poems are the bones." Unquote. She brings the monolingual English words of the case into a babel multilingualism of Arabic, Dutch, Fon, French, Greek, Hebrew, Italian, Latin, Portuguese, Spanish, Shona, Twi, West African Patois, and Yoruba. Beyond this linguistic diversity, letters form elementary prelinguistic sounds, I quote, grunts, plosives. Is this perhaps, perhaps, she asks, how language might have sounded at the beginning of time? To take one example, the first page of the poem, I don't know how clear it is, but you can read some of those, uh, resembles the white uh, beach of a page where shards of words, letters, lost languages have scattered like pieces of a shipwreck and we can re read among others, et cetera. So we can read all these sounds, guttural and, um, and, and, uh, and stuttering in really all the pages of the poem. Philip calls it a language of the grunt and groan, of moan and stutter, this language of pure sound, fragmented and broken by history. Paradoxically, this breaking up of language to its pre-human sounds marks the emergence of a poem written under the mark of the sacred by Philip and her co-author. You can read the co-author's name on the book cover and the co-author's name is also on the spine of the book. Uh, Suzong M. Nurbeze Philip, as told to the author by Sete Adamu Boateng. And Sete Adamu Boateng is the hallowed voice of the drowned um, ancestors. I talk about this more in the chapter that I pre circulated, so you're welcome to go back to, to it. I have titled this section bone water and not water bone, which would simply refer to a bone situated in water. Bone water is an impossible yet unavoidable oxymoron. The cover illustration of the 2008 Wesleyan paperback, John McElnan design, juxtaposes the grayscale image of sea waves interrupted in its center by a tibia bone and its fibula themselves interrupted by a blood red circle in its center with a Gyenyame, a West African Adinkra spirit symbol. The Gyenyame, Caribbean scholar Tanya Shields explains means, I quote, except for God, and situated on the only bit of color on the cover, the symbol looks ossified as well. Thus, from its visual beginning, Philip's text captures the idea of bodies, bones, and the spirit, unquote. The illustration is abstract enough. The fluid, the, psych the circle, the almost straight vertical, the gray and the red, that the reader can hold the book in her hands without perceiving the objects of its composition. While a bone should be more solid than water, the effect of transparency and marriage of textures of the image makes the one flow into the other. Before even the text begins, we already behold our bone water. The title of the first section of the poem per se is os, O-S. While os could be in Latin, it could also be a French word, os meaning bones or bone. In its plural form, os could be pronounced os or o, and thus homonymous with O, water, or waters. The necessary oxymoron is then also present in the section title. The shin bone on the cover is as gigantic as water, thereby implying that bones take as much space as water in our imagination of the drowned. The quest for bones is ubiquitous in water death or in mass graves. 
Bones are iconic in shields, bodies, and bones, in which she explains the bones of the enslaved Africans at the bottom of the Atlantic constantly caused me to consider the lack of value placed on and in black lives. Bones are everywhere. The cover image of the Zong, as well as the disjointed words and syllables composing the poem per se, present these bygone skeletal structures as shards of fragmented bodies. These fragments lying around, like in Ai Weiwei's remains, can be seen as the passive state resulting from the literal cutting up and objectification of humans under the action of slave traders and callous governments. However, the slashing of the legal case transcript is first and foremost for Philip, a subjective act of revenge and justice. One approach Philip explains, and I quote, was literally to cut up the text and just pick up words randomly, most similar to the activity of random picking of African slaves, selected randomly, then thrown together, hoping that something would come out of it, that they would produce something. What is being murdered and cut up is the legal report of the Zong case, which fails to do justice to the murdered humans. And here's more about Philip uh, really describing uh, how materially she does it, how she cuts up the text, or as she calls it, murders it. So I'm quoting, I murder the text, literally cut it into pieces, castrating verbs, suffocating adjectives, murdering nouns, throwing articles, prepositions, conjunctions overboard, jettisoning adverbs. I separate subject from verb, verb from object, create semantic mayhem until my hands bloodied from so much killing and cutting reach into the stinking eviscerated innards and like some seer, sangoma or prophet who having sacrificed an animal for signs and portents of new life or simply life reads the untold story that tells itself by not telling. Unquote. From a sacred perspective, the oxymoron of bone and water fuses two disparate yet complementary funerary practices, the tomb and the wake, the fixed and the performative. The legal transcript is for Philip, the tombstone, the one public marker of the murder of those Africans on board the Zong. It's a public monument, she writes, a textual monument marking their murder and their existence, their small histories that ended so tragically." Unquote. The case with its structured, articulated and whole frame is thus the skeleton, the geometric coffin or the hard grave. But such a fixed, dialectical and rigid monument is not enough since the tragic story of these many lost bodies and bones cannot be seized in this immense shipwreck and human wreck. My questions then are, how do we read wreckage? How can we make sense out of a story that cannot be told, yet cannot not be told? How do we maintain memorial, ethical, ethical and sacred imperatives in the shipwreck of language? Is the Zong a linguistic failure? I think not. As Philip claims, the resulting abbreviated disjunct disjunctive, almost nonsensical time of the poem demands a corresponding effort on the part of the reader to make sense of an event that eludes understanding, perhaps permanently." Unquote. The first 26 poems of the Zong are for Philip the bones of the poem, while the others are its flesh. Taking a step back to the poems, we begin to make sense of the apparent randomness of somewhat horizontal fragment. Zong number one from pages three to four fills up the entirety of the page with blocks of words and syllables not aligned in any cohesive way. The poem Ferrum, and this is the last page of the poem Ferrum and of the poem per se, from which you see an excerpt is built as a dense archipelagic zone in which the words become increasingly complex and illegible with the multiplication of fonts and letter rocks of impenetrable meaning, 
Er attend the men and sang the rue de Grogde. You can read these as you, as you wish. Ferrum ends, however, with a concrete poem in the form of um, literal isosceles, isosceles triangle. The triangle with its base turned upward resembles a boat floating above water in equilibrium. The words composing the triangle are proper names written in an elegant antiquated uh, cursive. The African names, Bektamba, Nuru, Okunade, Dolap, Moya, Ade, etc. resurface in the text, but are still locked up in the triangular hold of the slave ship or in the confine of the triangular trade. They dwell in the ambivalent place of rebirth and death of the slave ship, which uh, C.L.R. James and Grisson alike have theorized. While ferrum, the iron, can refer to an instrument of torture, it's also the signature material of Ogun, blacksmith god of war and iron in the Daome, Yoruba, Fon, and ultimately Vodun uh, religion of Haiti. The triangle associated with the title of the book Ferrum thus marks a phase of solidity and construction, transformation of metals of earth and fire. One of the veves or symbols of the loi Ogun Ferai or Ogu Ferai in uh, Haitian Vodou has as its base the same triangle, which can also represent an axe blade. Ferrum leaves its readers in the ambivalence between the tortured and the godly, the main subject and the maker of iron, the erasure of the past and the poiesis, the making at the heart of poetry. Philip herself, we could interpret, is mounted by the blacksmith loi Ogun, and thus by the sacred. Like the markings on an aging graves, the letters in Ebora, another section of the Zong, are typed over, turning the poem into, and this is not out of focus, uh, it's just the way it looks um, in the book, turning the poem into a watercolor palimpsest, an illegible yet undeniable presence absence in which in inscriptions of different times complete and obscure one um, another. And here, for instance, there's uh, examples of these words. Um, juxtaposed with each other, flowing into each other in, um, in a sort of palimpsest or mystery. A sharp sense of urgency surfaces with the multiplication on this page of the word us, which you can trace on several um, us here and us there and us. So the word us is multiplied along with its anagrammatic offspring, SOS, 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 OS, OS, save us, OS, bone souls, water parts are some of the words that can be made out in this page. Uh, so the um, oxymoron introduced at the beginning of this section, bone water is repeated in the dissolving of bone in the immaterial soul and the solidifying of water in water parts. Words clashing sometimes give way to happenstance multilingual neologism, such as os mortality and osas. Os mortality collides mortality and bonds. Osas derives from the word os and evokes the word rosas with its aesthetic sense of a symmetrical flowery motif on stained glass and its medical sense of the pathology of skin rashes, rosacea leaving us yet again in this ambivalent place between art and suffering. So to conclude, the cloak of water and ritual tragically reaches planetary dimensions. The drowned of the Gulf of Mexico, the Caribbean Sea, the Atlantic form an underwater nation with the boat people of the Pacific, with Indian, with East Indians indentured workers forced into an exiling taboo with the crossing of the Kalapani or Black Waters and with many other seafarers. Rohingya Muslims from Bangladesh and Myanmar 
are similarly struggling in the Indonesian seas. Sharply in our consciousness, the lethal abyss of the Caribbean resonates with the Mediterranean. As Martinican writer Patrick Chamoiseau vividly claims, the African continent at the bottom of the Atlantic meets with a stunned exactness its double in the Mediterranean, unquote. The UN reported that in June 2018 alone, and I'm taking this date as you know, I could have chosen many others, unfortunately. The UN reported that in June 2018 alone, one out of seven humans who attempted to cross the Mediterranean lost their lives at sea, a significant increase since 2017, when the percentage already tragic was one out of 38. The lives lost to the waters of the Gulf of Mexico, the Western Atlantic, and the Caribbean Sea tragically resonate with those of African and Middle Eastern asylum seekers or security seekers drowning by the thousands in the underwater cemetery of the Mediterranean and Eastern Atlantic to reach fortress Europe. Grim circuits are established between the Caribbean Sea and the Mediterranean. After his Caribbean sites, Taylor submerges sculptures in and around Europe. Uh, he has some uh, in the, the bottom of the Thames River in London, in Oslo, most recently in Cannes, and significantly in Lanzarote, a volcanic formation of the Canaries situated 140 kilometers from the Moroccan shores and 1,000 kilometers from Spain. The artist justifies the choice of Lanzarote, not only because of its status as a UNESCO biosphere reserve, but also because it is the site of the contemporary human tragedy of African migrants and refugees who have drowned in these waters. The Lanzarote installation is titled Raft of Lampedusa and connects to the political gesture of French painter Géricault's 1819 raft of Medusa, Le Radeau de la Méduse, which raised consciousness about the incompetence of the ship's captain and the newly restored French monarchy deemed responsible for the wreck of the frégate Méduse off the coast of Mauritania. Lampedusa, the Italian island situated between Sicilia and Malta, has become a tragic flagship for the unraveling refugee crisis with the thousands of Africans and Middle Easterners who attempt to reach this outpost of Europe and specifically for the October 3rd, 2013 wreck of a fishing boat in which 366 clandestine migrants perished. Taylor's, Glissant's and Phillips' ethical aesthetic utopias cohabit, co-live with the unconceivable numbers of victims, not merely of the ocean, but also of the walls that attempt to segregate it as they do humanity. May water, formidable water, rectify this stiffness, this rigor mortis, when it is fully endowed with its sacredness, beauty and relation. And may art continue to serve as a wake up call for border and forcing obsessed leaders and nations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thank you indeed. I'm, I'm sure there will be plenty of, uh, of questions. Um, this was extremely enlightening and thank you so much for the, the sharp focus uh, you have put on the, on the myriad ways, in fact, slavery linked massacres uh, mm. were so deeply and closely connected to uh, present day deaths in migration. Mm -hmm. And this is particularly uh, obvious at the end of your book, um, in fact, that this is something that you develop also through uh, Dal Lago's uh, watery graves, particularly, uh, yeah. but also, you know, other, yes, other works. Um, just to leave um, a bit of time for people to gather their thoughts and maybe put in their questions in the chat, or, um, you know, if they want to speak, I mean, of course, this is uh, absolutely uh, welcome. Um, Maybe I have, you know, one um, short and not so short um, questions. I mean, mm -hmm. you make it very clear that 
um, it's not only memorializing mm -hmm. that is at stake. Mm -hmm. um, it's also generating new ways and new routes mm -hmm. towards a nation that would um, not necessarily remedy anything, but nourish us uh, individually and, and collectively and create a kind of common space mm -hmm. uh, for all of us to inhabit and, uh, and share in our present time and, uh, and space. Mm -hmm. And what you were saying about the proximity of us and us mm -hmm. uh, as well in the text by mm -hmm. uh, Philip in Zong is, is particularly uh, telling in itself. So, mm -hmm. Um, you know, you have showed, I mean, in your talk and, and you do so in your book as well, um, you have showed that the, the, the stuttering and the groaning and the whispering that is, you know, that are involved in the reading uh, of Zong um, also enables us, actually, also enables us to perform uh, a new form of poesis, a new form of art making, and more generally, uh, a new form of performing. Mm -hmm. So how do you, uh, um, so of course the, the unmarked, you know, water graves uh, are sites of, you know, loss and haunting and art cannot undo mm, the trauma and the damage that has been done. Mm -hmm. But your book hinges on uh, the possibility that literature and artworks are also going to be sites of creation, not only recreation, but creation and connection that could mm -hmm. offer some form of remedy, some form of healing, mm -hmm. uh, and this common space you know, to inhabit and, uh, and share. So how do we deal with the tension, this tension between um, a story that cannot be told and cannot not be told, mm -hmm. as you were saying, and, and as uh, Philip also says in, in mm -hmm. uh, song. Yeah. And how do you account for the fact that multimedia, intermedial, um, transmedial works of art mm -hmm. seem to be better equipped yeah. to deal with the impossible task of telling mm -hmm. through untelling? Mm -hmm. Apologies for mm -hmm. yeah. the long question. No, these are, uh, thank you, uh, Judith. These are really um, excellent questions. And I'm, I'm glad you emphasized the, the fact that it's not just about memorializing. It's not about just uh, a gesture of the present, uh, you know, looking backwards uh, to the past, but it's also very much in the present. And I think, that's why I put so much emphasis on performativity. It's, it's, it's not something fixed or stable, but it's something that continues uh, in the present, in the future. And sometimes without us uh, and without the agency of artists and, and writers. So this continuity uh, into the present and future is central. And I didn't read us in us, but I could have. So thank you, I was, I was, uh, I was thinking about us and all les os or les eaux, bones or waters um, in French, but us and, and us, I think, is, is a good way to emphasize the importance of, uh, of a community, of, uh, of a communal, which is, uh, which, which is in question. Uh, what, what community are we, are these artists addressing from, um, from Philip to Jason de Kerr's Taylor to uh to 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 glissant i mean um if if we take glissant in the open boat uh there's uh, at least two um levels or two imbricated um uh, forms of communities uh that is expressed by the we uh there is uh you know we the africans we or we the descendants which um addresses a specific uh, targeted community and in the open boat, the we, the descendant becomes everyone, right? So there's a, there's a, there's a community of descendants of enslaved Africans, which concerns then everyone. Uh, if we think of, um, of, uh, of Nubese Philip, uh, she also, of course, um, 
you know, refers to uh, the descendants of Africans and memorializing uh, murdered, uh, captured and murdered uh, Africans. But there's also uh, in her Notanda, particularly a lot of references to other uh, events of uh, similar scale, such as the Shoah. That's also really a, an important reference for, for Philip. But if you think of Jason Decares Taylor, that's an interesting point as well, because his primary and initial goal was ecological. He started uh, building these underwater museums and putting his statues underwater with the ecological purpose of uh, providing um, structures for coral reefs and other forms of life to reappear. And there was this uh, circle of humans holding hands that I showed you as one of the sl uh, slides. This is uh, vicissitudes, vicissitudes, which was at first on social media read as a memorialization of the drowned of the Middle Passage. But then some critics intervened and said, you know, Jason DeCares Taylor never thought about the Middle Passage. It's just a coincidence. So there's a, a bit of a controversy about this. And what I uh, argued in the book is that, um, you know, the site itself, the site of drowning these anthropomorphic sculptures at the bottom of the Caribbean uh, Sea, uh, uh, the site itself is a co-creator of that community. It cannot not refer to that community as well. And it's interesting that, um, you know, Jason Decares Taylor, whose uh, goal in his first installations was ecological, is now uh, tied to um, a concern for, uh, for the the murder or the death of um, of humans uh, attempting to cross the Atlantic uh, Ocean and the Mediterranean, so his uh, his installation in um, in the site of Lanzarote, and it's interesting because it's in Lanzarote in the Canary Island in the Atlantic, but then the installation is called um, the Raft of of Lampedusa. So there's these two. Mm -hmm spaces of uh you know that are both symbolic of of uh of hum of loss of 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 a, of a, of a human uh, catastrophe um that has become i mean it, he became not uh not able not to also mm. uh speak mm. to 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 that so there's a, it's an interesting evolution in the artists uh in the artist's work. And then your question about multimedia and intermedial and transmedial, absolutely. I'm, I'm a literary scholar. I, you know, I work, uh, I was trained in, in poetry. You know, I was trained in reading, uh, reading fiction and poetry mostly. And when I started to, I mean, I worked on food too. Uh, so I learned to read that medium too. But, um, but when I started my work, uh, th this, the book Water Graves really um, happened or started happening after uh, Hurricane Katrina and all the human disaster associated with it happened in 2005. I used to live in Louisiana. So this is something that hit me. Uh, hit me personally. And I uh, realized while meeting, uh, well, first of all, I realized I could not work on poetry alone and that there was so much going on in mixed media art and in photography that I couldn't, uh, that I couldn't really do without in the book. So I started, um, you know, I started working on uh, mixed media installations, underwater sculptures, um, and and uh, and uh, and also intermedial installations that use both, um, you know, sounds and and material uh, objects. Uh, but by talking to these artists who um, practiced art in New Orleans and who, for the ones I, I worked, uh, I worked on lost a lot of their belongings uh, in, in Hurricane Katrina, they could never, um, they could never produce, create art the same way. So let's mm. say someone who was photographing, uh, you know, jazz musicians in New Orleans, very pretty uh, black and white pictures did not do 
I mean, it had to move to multi, uh, and this is um, Eric Water, um, could not just choose one media, but had to work with clarinets and sounds and, and jazz. And I think that's, uh, you know, that's really connected, Judith, to the, mm -hmm. you know, the, 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 the bind of, um, that we are in of um, a story that is not able to be told yet cannot not be told. And of course, this is not new and, um, uh, you know, it's, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking of Blanchot, for instance, in uh, discourse of the disaster makes makes a, a similar um, mm -hmm. similar argument. So this is not new, but I think that that multimedia and also collaboration between artists also speaks to that impossibility of telling in one medium. Yes, and and it's interesting to note as well that Zong in itself mm -hmm. is. Uh, transmedial and I mean it includes you know you can think of I mean it's performance it's it's sculpture it's uh visuals uh it's not only text as text obviously so uh, obviously obviously and uh and 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 this is just the beginning of song um uh Nubese Philip has on uh, you can find them on YouTube uh, various oral renderings of, yes. of her poem Zong and uh it you know it appears uh, completely different sometimes the uh, sometimes the line that separates the poem and the name of um, of the drowned uh, completely disappears in the in the oral rendering uh, silences are read differently in each occurrence so it's a uh, it's I mean this is really this is really in turn like the uh, Gregson versus Gilbert case this is in turn the beginning, the body, mm. uh, the the bones that needs to be recreated each time there's a new rendering of it. Uh, mm. uh, yeah. Mm. Thank you. Um, yeah. So th there is um, there are questions that have started coming in um, in the in the chat. Uh, Francesca, do you, would you like to? Uh, in fact, sum up your your question orally. If you do, you want to put your mic on, or would you rather? Valérie, um, yeah, no, happy to. Yeah, so, yeah, I'm actually second generation Chilean exile, which is mm -hmm. partly where this question comes from, but um, it, it, it just really struck me that the words that uh, you had on your opening slide were exactly the same words that are spoken by um, the protagonist in um, uh, Nostalgia for the Light by Patricio Guzman, and she mm -hmm has spent decades looking for her husband's bones in the Atacama Desert. And it just, uh, throughout your talk, just more and more thoughts kind of were occurring around, um, you know, the, that the desert as an elemental a space where the elements are kind of bordering really. Um, and she speaks of how, um, you know, the high salt content of the desert, um, because it, you know, obviously follows the whole line of Pacific, so it always has you see fox coming in, um, means that any bones that are found, it's pretty much impossible to identify uh, any DNA in it. Either way, what bones there are are utterly fragmented from the constant erosion of the salt winds. So identification is really difficult. Um, so, so that's one of the things that I was kind of interested, um, if you could potentially speak a little bit more about yeah. um, where the sea and the land potentially cross over, but also, if you've seen this or the pearl button, which is the second part of the trilogy, um, yeah. so yes, Guzman has a very poetic approach to talking about mm -hmm. this, as do the interviewees and the how that mm -hmm. there are parallels between the written uh, form and the filmic form here. Right, right. No, I haven't. I haven't seen it, but I, I will watch it. Uh, I will watch it now. But the the questions that that you raise are really uh, really fascinating, and this this started occupying me, especially the question of the desert uh, has started o occupying me when I was finishing up um, the book. I see my friend, uh, my friend and colleague uh, Naima Hashad is uh, here in the audience. But towards the end of the book, she. Uh, sent me um, 
a variety of uh, of of works of of arts by um, um, artists from uh, Morocco and 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 Libya, and uh, also pointed out to me the fact that sea crossers uh, before crossing the sea uh, also often cross uh, cross the desert. So there's uh, there's first of all this continuity. Uh, between deserts and uh, you know the crossing of the Sahara and the crossing of the Mediterranean, which is uh, which is you know unified by by the same passage of um, of uh, refugees and uh, and migrants, and there's also something to to be done, I think, about the materiality of of, of the desert and and sand, which is. Uh, which um, you know, which brings about. Uh, I mean, Philip creates the word exaqua, but what do we? What would it mean to retrieve bones from the sand and the Sahara? It's. Uh, I think there's also a loss uh, for language here, and um, you know, I'm thinking of uh, of this obsession for bones, whether they're uh, interred in mass graves or immersed in water or uh, altered by by sand is is I think a universal obsession especially I mean in, in the loss of everybody but especially in the loss of collective death um, I'm thinking of also of the um, Algerian um, writer uh, Tahar Jaoud, Les Chercheurs, Les Chercheurs d'eau, Les Chercheurs d'os, um, where uh, the uh, character, main character is looking for his brother's uh, bones in, in the sand. So they would be, um, yeah, I think, I think this opens up some, some, uh, some really, a really interesting avenue and it would be interesting to see what, what happens to aesthetic forms of, of art when they are, um, you know, shaped by sand and not water. So yeah, that's a that's a really good question. Thank you. Comments. Mm -hmm. um, Claudine, there was a question from Claudine, one of my colleagues, uh, about Valérie, le cimetière marin. Bonjour Claudine. Yeah. <laughs> Bonjour. Bonjour. Okay, I'm going to switch to English because I think a lot of people might not uh, um, speak uh, French. Now, I just thought about the Cimetière Marin. I mean, I'm not, I mean, it's a very long poem and a very complex one, but I, I thought that uh, somehow uh, it's, it's the antinomy, if you want, of, of what you were describing. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, I suppose he uh, ponders about the fact that the graves in the Cimetière Marin uh, are are empty. I mean, the bones are, are not there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So uh, uh, there's, a, there's a geographical tropism, if I can say that, because I just was in set the other day, and and you know that the name of our university is Paul Valéry. So so this is also why I thought about uh, Le Cimetière Marin. It could be interesting to think about the fact that they had to build a cimetière marin in, in set. So I don't know if there are many others, you see, as opposed to what you're describing, which is, which is at a loss and, you know, an attempt to, to memorialize. So that, that is, you know, somewhere, somewhat in between somehow. Right, so uh, it's it's it's. I mean, it's it's interesting, and it's it's also funny that you mention uh, Paul Valéry's grave in the uh, in in set in that beautiful beautiful cemetery in, in set. Uh, I was just thinking about that cemetery uh, because I was I rediscovered Brassens' song, uh, his uh, his plea to be <laughs> to be interred in the set. Uh, anyway, I've been listening to this song a lot, so. Uh, yeah, and um, actually, one day I was looking for the for the for the grave of Paul Valéry in Set, and I didn't find it. But I, I did find Georges Brassens's very peaceful uh, <laughs> peaceful grave uh, site, and uh, actually had a picnic there with another professor who was visiting at Montpellier at the time. So, um, but anyway, yes, I, I did I did consider Paul Valéry's uh, Cimetière Marin. 
um, of course, but I think you're you're right that it's you know it's about construction, it's about uh, and it's it's a little bit antithetical because the cimetière marin is by the sea but not submerged in the sea, even though it could uh, eventually. And I think there would be a lot of um, parallels to draw between uh, Paul Valéry's grave and poem and uh, Glissant, Edouard Glissant's grave in uh, Le Diamant. Martinique, who was very much inspired by Paul Valéry's Cimetière Marin, and who had also yeah. his grave. But my other comment about in the chat, uh, Valéry, would be, since I know you know uh, Toni Morrison fairly well, um, somehow I see uh, Philip as, 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 as in, in a lineage, if you want, and even a lineage from, um, let's say, Song of Solomon, where you do have bows. Yeah. A bag of bones, mm -hmm. and, and you know, those are very prominent. Um, down to, um, I suppose, beloved, which is you know, this fully clothed woman walked, you know, she walked out of the water, and and so it seems that Morrison somehow, uh, you know, the, these texts could be stepping stones, if I can say that. To, I mean, poetic stepping stones towards what you're doing and towards what um, Philip is doing. Um, in terms of the imaginary, you know, of you know, of the middle passage and 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 of the um, water, the beloved passage at the in, in the middle, uh, mm -hmm. you know, is, to me seems to be a, 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 a pretext, a text that comes before what you have ju just shown us uh, mm -hmm. in in Zong in many ways. Yeah. So I don't know if you you know if you want to comment on that if you if you if you yeah. think the lineage is appropriate with the departure, obviously, something much more radical than, than Morrison. Yeah, I mean, there's, I think there's really a, a kinship between, uh, between Philip and, and Morrison. And yeah, it's hard not to think about uh, Pilot in, uh, in Song of Solomon's mm -hmm. uh, carrying, uh, carrying her father's bones, I think, in, uh, in her. Yes. She thinks, she thinks the bones are, you know, the white man um, mm -hmm. that uh, Milkman has, um, Milkman, no, Macon has mm -hmm. killed, but in fact the bones are her fathers and yes. of their fathers, mm -hmm. and in fact they bury the bones, you see, as opposed to what, to what, to what you are describing, which is an impossibility of finding the bones, of burying the bones. Yeah. But then yeah. you have been lost. I think sort of plays with this idea, I mean, with what you've just described. Mm -hmm. So to me, when I see what you give us, you know, as examples from Philip, mm -hmm. to, to me, it's a much more radical uh, departure, still with links, obviously, to, you know, these, you know, the, the, let's say the the text that comes before, you know, I mean, Gates would say it signifies on, you know, I, I think it's so easy to say that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I think I think that's right. Um, but again, I think that what what uh, what makes the bonds is in the, in Zong so particular is that they are uh, underwater, and this develops uh, certain pr properties in the poem and in the method um, of the text. But yeah, I think it would be. I mean, I, I think it would be um, it would be crucial to look at. Uh, and Tanya Shields, uh, an author I quoted um, mm -hmm. in my presentation in her text, Bodies and Bones, does a, a more uh, systematic analysis of, of, of bones in, um, in uh, the production of descendants of the African diaspora in the Caribbean and in the US. So um, yeah, I mean, there's definitely something to, um, to, 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 to search. Uh, into this parentage of, of bones. Uh, I also just want to say that bones, I mean, I, I chose bones today for this talk and I kind of compiled several sections of the book. Uh, so um, bones was one of the concerns that I, I had in, in, in the book, was, but was not as central as, uh, you know, uh, bones in uh, Tanya Shield, uh, Bodies and Bones, for instance. But right. yeah, I think- um, maybe, maybe we could um, switch to maybe one last uh, question because I'm, I'm keeping an eye on the on the watch. I know you, you have an engagement as well uh, afterwards, Valérie. 
Um, but there is a question from Marwa. Marwa, would you would you like to um, put your mic on? Yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. I don't know. It's morning at some places. Evening uh, elsewhere. So <laughs> hi, everyone. Um, yeah. So um, thank you very much for this outstanding uh, presentation. So I'm I'm actually a PhD student and working on Zong under uh, Dr. Misrahi Barak. So I was uh, totally interested with this presentation. My question, I'll make it quickly. Um, so the, the poem itself is very complicated to be understood. And she herself decided to do this periodical reading for everyone which, which are available on YouTube to help people really grasp the words and to, to give them really the aspects of the journey um, of slavery. So she, she, she really breaks the boundaries of the, the, of, of the language in general through establishing her own poetry. And um, because she believed that the legal document was really silencing this truth and her poem is a kind of response to, mm -hmm. to, to the truth that was neglected. Um, and uh, of course they consider it so those slaves as good. So my question was related, I think I heard that you mentioned that she, um, she, uh, her poem complements the legal document and I was wondering if you consider her poem as really a compliment, I mean she, she complements this legal document or more she tries to respond back to it or um, deconstruct yeah. what has been told by, by really creating her own new truth uh, through a very deconstructed and fragmented language. Yeah, thank you for these comments. Are you at Paul Valéry? Uh, yes. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, thank you for these comments. They're, uh, they're really helpful. And I think you're right to um, question the term complement. I think I use the term complement uh, to refer to the structure of, uh, of the zone and to the different parts with the acknowledgements complement uh, the poems, uh, which complement the glossary, which complement the case. I was, I was more talking about the internal structure of the text. I don't see the Zong as a complement to uh, the case. Uh, the case, uh, I think it's a radical, uh, I mean, you know, considering the Zong as, as a complement, would be putting the Zong, uh, the, the Grexers, Gregson versus Gilbert case as originary. And I really don't want to, to do that. Uh, I think that one of the, uh, one of the, one of the, I mean, the bones of the text are what remain in this violent uh, archive, but yeah, the, the term to complement is not enough. So I would say, yeah, she says murder, deconstruct, um, uh, reassemble, uh, insufflate life and reverence. Um, you know, because by choosing a, a co author who's a departed person uh, and placing it on the spine of the book, Philippe and Botong as a co-author, she's really doing something more than just responding to history, but she's speaking and writing and reading with the ancestors. So um, yeah, I don't think complimenting with, uh, is, 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 a, is a proper term of describing the song, but it's, it's great to hear you're, you're working on it. And uh, yeah, I would encourage everyone to to listen to the YouTube videos. We were lucky to uh, have Nubezi Philip at Emory last year, I think, and it was quite special to, um, to have her. And she you know, had a ceremonial, she gave us pieces of, of fabric, which would be the lancel or the shroud, pieces of the shrouds. Uh, so so it's, it's not just writing, it's not just oral, but it's also sharing, you know, material. Mm -hmm. Pieces. There was a, there was a lovely talk as well organized by uh, Alisa Trotz uh, as well as part of this uh, you know performing mm -hmm. areas so that was uh, also very good. I think we'll have to you know wrap up because I'm I'm um, um, you know have, keeping an eye on the on the watch as mm -hmm. well. So I want to thank you again. I mean it's been really enlightening uh, talk. So thank you so much. There were 
a lot of comments in the uh, in the chat uh, as well. And yeah. I also wanted to mention that you are um, a project, you know, team member. So you're part of this thematic ethics uh, project, which is, you know, focused on migration and circulation of bodies, dead bodies uh, in migratory uh, context. So this is our, you know, focus. Um, so there will be an event, another online event that will happen on the 1st and the 2nd of April. Um, please get on, you know, if you want to hear back from us directly, uh, write to us if you still need to be put on a mailing list. Uh, it will be mentioned on the posted on websites as well. Um, and there will be another physical flesh and blood um, event on campus at Paul Valéry at EMA and so uh, probably happening in the very last few days in September. We haven't circulated, there will be a call for papers, an open call for papers that will be circulated for that event. So please be on the, on the lookout and we'll be back in touch uh, with you about that. And, um, and I'm sure, you know, either Thomas or Bidisha, um, you want to say something uh, in conclusion, maybe about the, uh, the ways, you know, people can access the videos uh, of the webinars uh, as well. Thank you again, Valérie, and uh, we'll, we'll certainly be in touch. Thank you, Judith and Petitia and Thomas for this invitation. It was great to be with you with you today, this morning. And uh, I hope the chat will be safe because there's some interesting questions on there. Uh, so is the chat going to be to be safe? Um, I am, not, I, I'll, I'll save it, yeah. Oh, okay. I'll make sure it's saved, yeah. Thank, Thank you so you. much. Really enjoyed Thank your you. talk. This Great time. meeting Thank you and seeing some of you um, virtually. Um, merci Did you tell you want to say something about the video? Yeah, I just put the link there yeah. in the chat box. That's yeah. where we're uploading all our videos after just editing them a little bit. Um, so uh, you can watch that space and we'll be uploading uh, today's, uh, the recording of today's talk as well soon. So. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, in one month time, on the twelfth of uh, uh, of March, uh, wait, yeah, twelfth of March, we get another. Our next webinar will be on by Felicien de Hoche from the University of Liège, and he will talk about the transnational engagement around Senegalese migrant death. Right, so it's a continuity of the previous one we had on on the on the Tajik. So how the migrants take care of their, of their dead. And in fact, what is at the, what is at the focus um, of these, uh, you know, well, webinars and sessions and, and projects? I mean, it's how the community of the dead inform and give cohesion uh, and togetherness to the community of the, of the living, of course. So this is, it's this tension, in fact, that is uh, part of our um, hypothesis. So, so thank you again. Um, bye, everyone, and we'll um, we'll see each other soon. Mm -hmm. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.